Um, so, hello and welcome to the fourth external session of Women in Econ and Policy. Uh, Women in Econ and Policy is a community that was set up with the aim of creating a free and inclusive space for women interested in econ, policy and development and to learn and grow together. Uh, the motive behind the group is to build each other up by sharing ideas and skills and to make econ and policy spaces more accessible. Our external session series is thus a step in learning from the inspiring women in our field and to know more about their journeys. Uh, before we proceed, uh, some uh, quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, the session is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website soon after the session. Uh, the session is based on questions that we've collected beforehand, but please feel free to send questions on the chat uh, and we'll try to take them on uh, during the session. Uh, we encourage you to keep your videos on if possible. And uh, yeah, I think we can get started. I'll start off by introducing our moderator, Niharika, who will then introduce him. Uh, so Niharika Bekrur is a policy manager in the payments and governance uh, team at JPAL South Asia. She graduated from the Masters in Law and Diplomacy program at the Fletcher School uh, from Tufts University with a concentration in human security and development economics. Uh, before Fletcher, Naharika worked as a campaigner with Amnesty International, working on migrant rights and business and human rights. Naharika uses her experience in the field of rights-based approaches to development to ensure gender and economic equity, and currently works on a portfolio project. Uh, thank you, Naharika, for joining us, and over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Prashanta, and congrats on the fourth uh, external session uh, for this group. I think it's really exciting uh, what you guys have set up, and it is my pleasure to introduce Yamini Ayer today. Um, Yamini Ayer is the President and Chief Executive of Center for Policy Research. In 2008, uh, Yamini founded the Accountability Initiative at CPR. And under her leadership, the Accountability Initiative has produced significant research in the areas of governance, state capacity, and social policy. Yamini's own research on social accountability, elementary education, decentralization, and administrative reform has received both academic and popular recognition. Yamini Ayer is a TED Fellow and a founding member of the International Experts Panel of the Open Government Partnership. She has also been a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Good Governance. Uh, previously, she has worked with the World Bank's Water and Sanitation Program and Rural Development Unit in uh, New Delhi. Uh, Yamni is an alumna of the London School of Economics, St. Edmunds College, Cambridge University, and St. Stephen's College, uh, Delhi University. So uh, a warm welcome to you, uh, Yamini, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's an absolute ple pleasure and privilege for me to be here and many congratulations to the organizers for putting together this platform uh, and for uh, moving it forward to its fourth uh, discussion. Look forward to the conversation. Great. Uh, so I think we will begin with um, what these type of conversations always begin with, a look into your uh, professional journey. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, your professional journey? How did you get to where you are? And um, I think I'm also very interested to know what were some of the key influences you had um, while growing up or during your career path. <laughs> Thank you. I think, um, you know, in, in so many ways, professional journeys, when one looks back at them, and it's a bit scary to think that now I'm at that stage where I actually have a lot to look back on. <laughs> Uh, uh, you find that it's some combination of uh, the universe working out and leading you in a certain direction uh, and along the way uh, a series of opportunities that come uh, and a series of uh, uh, influences and influencers that shape one's thinking and therefore also shape one's journey and in that sense mine is no different to many uh, um, uh, but 
you know, I, I kind of, uh, I, um, as a, uh, as, as a, what, what in my growing up years, uh, my mother was uh, a sort of, uh, uh, it, it did various things, but for one a significant phase of my teenage life, she was a journalist. Um, and she used to, she was doing two very interesting things. One, uh, she set up a news magazine that basically translated uh, uh, vernacular newspapers into English. Uh, and of course, this was in, in the early 90s, late 80s, 90s, when the internet wasn't so, what well, didn't exist, uh, not even, wasn't even a matter of prevalence. Um, and so information sources uh, were very limited uh, in that uh, to your community. So uh, the English speaking press had an outsized influence amongst the English speaking elite. Uh, but, you know, uh, the Hindi press had an outsized influence amongst the Hindi speaking elite, but rarely did, the, did those two worlds necessarily interact. Um, similarly with Southern India, and across the country, right? And we didn't have access in the way in which now at a click of a button you can. Uh, so her endeavor was to translate uh, news uh, um, and opinion uh, in vernacular that was coming out in the vernacular press that was deeply influential in particular uh, in the context in which uh, the, the, these news papers were being printed and circulated, um, but to create a kind of cross-language cross conversation. Um, and like all things where, were that, that tend to be of working mothers, uh, this was uh, being moved out of the garage in our home, and all of us uh, were participants in uh, this process. So, uh, you know, her translators, her copy editors, her proofreaders, everybody would come together and they became part and parcel of our family family and me and my sisters, I'm one of three we all actively participated uh, in helping her out uh, in whatever way we could. And I'm sure uh, looking back uh, that we probably caused more problems for her than help. But nonetheless, what that did do for me was that it gave me a very, very uh, uh, unexpected opportunity to learn about what was happening in a, across the country. And, you know, this was also a phase of both very significant political turmoil in the early 90, late 80s and early 90s. But also very significant social turmoil as India was about going through this transition of its economy and uh, uh, entering a new phase, uh, both in terms, uh, both economically, socially. Uh, and so a lot of what one read gave a sense that there was a lot of social transformation taking place that we um, uh, across the country that uh, in one's own life one didn't necessarily have that much access to and experience of. So it tweaked an interesting interest and curiosity for me in wanting to learn about the country and wanting to be more engaged in this social transformation process. Um, and then she also would go off uh, on various reporting trips uh, and uh, would take us along with her, especially in our summer holidays. And I'm sure we all went. In fact, I have memories of going kicking and screaming and making her life quite difficult. Because uh, as a teenager, to be pushed off on a train for three days into the middle of nowhere was really the last thing way one wanted to spend one summer vacation. Uh, but we had no choice. Uh, and in that process, uh, you know, she used to do a lot of reporting on whatnot nonprofits, NGOs across the country, particularly in, uh, I remember trips to Bihar and Rajasthan uh, and the Northeast. We did one long trip in Sikkim, uh, all the way down to Darjeeling and, and, and Calcutta, uh, where one just got exposed to the kinds of uh, work that NGOs were doing and the kinds of engagement they were having with people's everyday lives. And I think that combination of things influenced me, certainly away from thinking about uh, a professional life in the private sector and an interest in, 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 in being more engaged in these processes and transitions that were unfolding around us. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, when I finished school and I started look, uh, looking at uh, what I wanted to do in my undergraduate years, uh, I got uh, exceedingly lucky. Um, you know, all of us who've been through the CBSE system know that that best of four is, uh, is what really changes your life. Mercifully, I finished my school, school, schooling in India before 100% cutoffs existed. Uh, but even so, I did remarkably bad 
badly in English, as is as tends to happen in uh, in the CBSE, and as a consequence of that, my best of four and English was mandatory, so my best of four dropped uh, a lot more than it should have, and that actually turned out to it was a very very disappointing uh, uh, disappointing moment uh, at one level, but it also turned out to be a remarkable opportunity because I had to start thinking differently about what I you know what I could do where I wanted to get an edge uh, and, and what opportunities would come uh, would present themselves to me and you know of course uh, coming from the family backgrounds that all of us here probably do high quality higher education in in a high quality institution was an absolute essential uh, but the question was uh, uh, you know, where, how, what would be the, so I started thinking harder and I applied for uh, history and philosophy degrees and as luck would have it, I got admission into both in, in St. Stephen's. Um, and, and so faced with a choice, uh, I, I decided to take a risk uh, because I, I was, uh, you know, in talking to people realized that philosophy in St. Stephen's was a class of seven people. And in that class of seven, there was, uh, you know, I felt that I would thrive in a small space and then an opportunity to, to, to you know sort of uh, be with a smaller group of people so my parents are uh, sort of wondered what it, what on earth is she going to do with a philosophy degree but were willing to let me go along with it and that actually in a funny way proved to be a great uh, education because although I'm uh, uh, far too practical and pragmatic to uh, have ever wanted a life in the world of ideas purely in the world of ideas rather uh, but it gave me a set of analytical skills and tools that I think have always been uh, uh, been uh, very, very uh, helpful to me and have stood me in good stead through life. Uh, but obviously, I had never intended to use that degree as uh, the sort of um, as a way of uh, engaging within one specific discipline and I was always uh, it had always been at the back of my mind that I had to find a way back into the practical world of social transformation um, and uh, I, I then chose to uh, sort of uh, hone my interests in sociology and political theory both of which I think have intellectual roots in philosophy and so, um, uh, so, so I became interested there and I went on after my undergrad degree to do uh, a degree in social and political sciences at Cambridge University, which is the second BA degrees that they give where you basically convert a three-year degree into a two-year degree. Um, and, uh, you know, that experience made me increasingly more convinced that my instinct that I wanted to have a professional life in a world that was much more engaged in the everyday lives of people and that actually part in, that contributed to and uh, 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 affected uh, people's, uh, this whole process of social change and transformation that we were witnessing in India was something that I, uh, that, that, that I wanted to take much more seriously uh, than just an academic interest. Um, and I, when I came back finishing that degree um, and started thinking about what a professional trajectory would look like, I think there were two very critical things that shaped what I did next. One that, um, Perhaps it was because of that moment, the moment of the late 1990s, uh, when uh, you know India was opening up, and for all of us uh, in in who, whose lives were dominated with life in the cities, there was suddenly this sort of proliferation of opportunity in ways that our parents' generation just never had. Um, and private sector uh, became so attractive, whereas anything that was associated with traditional public uh, was seen as, uh, was, was, not, was not necessarily seen as a place for uh, innovation, opportunity, and a future. I think it was it was really that particular moment. And uh, you know, now looking back, I'm struck at how many of my peer group in in university were all children of the IAS, children of uh, uh, of government and the public sector, and not one of us really actively considered the public sector as a place where we could anchor ourselves. In fact, there was a couple of uh, friends from college who sat for the UPSC. Um, 
and all and all of them had tales of torture to share with us whereas everybody else was giving the cat and mat i forget what what those were but you know heading into the world of mbas to head out to the united states to catch the uh, the bubble of the late 90s make your way to wall street and and uh, and those of us who were not so keen on the sort of mba trajectory were also uh, suddenly faced with a, a a different kind of set of opportunities in which the public didn't actually play such a significant role so journalism you know ndtv was just becoming a big uh, 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 converting to a, to its own company it was breaking from star news or maybe it was with star news at the time but becoming a 24/7 news channel uh, the journalism profession was proliferating civil society organizations research institutions were all beginning to uh, become very present and prevalent and a lot of interesting talent was moving there and the general narrative was these are the spaces of opportunity so it was only natural for me to look at um a combination of journalism and civil society as as options uh and you know i i certainly knew that uh despite uh having a journalist in uh, influencer in my family which is my mother that was not a career i was interested in uh but uh so so civil society organizations the ngo sphere uh, was a, was one that uh, i was keen to explore and i'm sure uh, the fact that uh, i spent a lot of my childhood with my mother as she was writing stories of all these amazing people who were spread across different parts of india working for social change uh, may well have influenced me um but i i spent about uh, right after my cambridge degree a couple of years with ngos at, at that point the self help groups and micro credit was a big thing uh and uh, that's where a lot of the funding was going that's where a lot of the ngos were also experimenting with this so um uh, so, so i worked with a couple of non profits that were working specifically quickly with self help groups on micro enterprises and uh, and micro finance uh, more broadly um but as i traveled around the country uh, you know i found my interest was less in these issues of uh, um, uh, uh, enterprise as much as uh, i kept hearing this yearning for the state everywhere we went the the the, the narrative always was uh, sarkar aayegi sadak banayegi swasthya kendra banega school chalega um and it really struck me i said this a few i've been able to better articulate it more recently but uh, it, it struck me even then that you know we we are all of a generation which was feeling released from the tentacles of the state uh, as as they were as the world of opportunity uh, and the animal spirits were unfolding and the world of opportunity was being presented to us um, in the cities and the minute you step away there's this yearning for the great for the grand old state that we all abhorred that was going to come and and in some ways you know it, with all its my bap failures help enable people to access the kinds of opportunities that we were beginning to reveal it i mean i remember the thing i missed most when i finished my cambridge degree and came back to india for a few years to find myself really was the coffee shop so for me back in the day even the starbucks coffee as a student one can't afford but the fact that these little little places existed in the uk and there wasn't any place for us as 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 uh, as young adults to go this was in the days before baristas and cafe coffee days had uh, found their way in in fact when i was in college in delhi all the way actually till the early 2000s uh, for those of you who are familiar with delhi there's uh, one restaurant called moets in the defense colony market which was the only place that served food and uh, and booze that one could afford uh, and was also the only place where one could go with one's girlfriends and not feel intimidated by the surrounding of men uh, where you could actually have uh, uh, have yourself a pleasant evening i mean so those were, so it was either five star hotels moets restaurant or nothing um and when i came back from cambridge i really missed that and but, but literally it was a matter of a year and a half and suddenly the barista moment happened and soon after cafe coffee day opens up and you see and people are out in the streets and everyone is dressing differently and talking differently and i remember even um 
in, in my Cambridge days, when I first went to study, all my peers from Europe were talking, they, they, their pop culture references were things that came, would always take five years before they'd reach India. Uh, and uh, now with MTV and Channel V, it was all there. So, you know, our lives are transitioning and yet you step away and everyone is wanting all the things that we were running away from to move to the next level. So it, it sort of, that sort of, uh, all of that made me feel that I wanted to understand understand the Indian state better. And I wanted to find some ways of working more closely with this idea of this yearning for the state. Uh, and of course, this yearning for, for the state also came uh, very closely intersected with the narrative of the violence of the state. So, you know, the, this, uh, the, the fact that this, the Indian state is corrupt, the fact that the Indian state is apathetic, the fact that it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the disempowered uh, actually face the worst violence was also part of that narrative. And that too, you know, sort of, uh, I, I think I noticed it a lot more sharply in my later years, but I think it stayed somewhere there. So this question of how do you make the state work better uh, was something that was very much on my mind. Um, and having spent, but having spent some time with the nonprofit sector, something was not adding up for me. I, I felt that there were two things that were missing. There was a lot of passion and a lot of commitment, but there was also a lot of uh, disorganization in its operational style. And um, very often the passion and commitment would, oh, would create very powerful personalities that didn't necessarily create spaces and opportunities for ideas. I, you know, so I, there was, it, it, it just, I, I just instinctively felt that there was something about the way in which these, at least the places that I was engaging with, and I spent some time both with a grassroots NGO as well as with an international NGO. I felt that this was, and, and then there was also a question of scale. So some combination of those three things made me feel that this wasn't quite what I wanted to do, although I knew that this was broadly where I wanted to be. Um, and uh, the yearning for uh, Starbucks, uh, uh, which sounds really silly now, uh, was still quite strong, uh, even though Barista and Cafe Coffee they had come. I felt I hadn't finished that part of my life, so I wanted to go back to study, um, and and went to uh, the London School of Economics to do this to do a degree in development studies. I think looking back. I should have done that differently. Uh, development studies degrees, and this is where I don't know that I got the right advice, but everybody encouraged me to be multidisciplinary in my approach. Uh, and I too was quite taken up with this idea. Uh, but I think that development studies degrees tend to tend to err on the side of too much multidisciplinary and don't always give you a disciplinary anchor that allows you a certain uh, perspective with which you view the world into which you can draw different disciplines. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that was also a time when this whole, the debates on participation, accountability, governance, voice were beginning to come into the mainstream of the developmental development literature in the international development world as well, as it was also in India. Um, and so, so that sort of became the perfect coming together of my own interest in understanding the state, this theoretical framework that was becoming uh, quite popular and popularized in teaching, uh, especially a development theory uh, about the importance of participation, the importance of thinking about empowerment from the point, from a bottom-up perspective rather than a top-down economist perspective, uh, and beginning to engage with the uh, grapple with the challenge of poverty differently. Um, and I, uh, you know, having felt disenchanted to a degree with the NGO space once I finished my degree thought that perhaps then the international development agencies might be an interesting place uh, to be. So I, uh, I, I came back to India, spent some time with the Ford Foundation working with um, uh, on their governance program, which is a very, very important moment for me professionally in the sense that it gave me a bird's eye view into how civil society organizations were engaging from the bottom up with these questions 
conditions of participation, transparency, and accountability, which was slowly becoming a movement in India. So I got a much deeper understanding of um, the differences between uh, professionalized NGOs, social movements, their articulations, their engagements with the ecosystem, uh, convincing me further that this is this is the area I wanted to work in. Uh, but I finished the Ford Foundation. These were these two year uh, young professional programs um, after which you have to go on into the big bad world. Um, and I joined the World Bank at a time when the World Bank itself was just coming out of the World Development Report that they had put together in 2004 uh, called Making Services Services Work for the Poor, I think it was called. But you know, the, 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 this group of growth economists suddenly now thinking about accountability, voice, empowerment, uh, citizen state compacts, um, uh, local governance was quite a transition for the for, for the bank uh, and I happened to be very lucky that I got caught in that moment of that transition. Uh, I was brought in as a young research associate and that I think was the most definitive professional moment uh, for me in that I had the opportunity of working with Land Pritchett, with Jeffrey Hammer, all of whom had just come to India. Uh, and uh, my joining the World Bank coincided with another uh, uh, friend and someone who's become a lifelong friend and colleague, Salima Samji, who had just finished her MPID degree uh, at the Kennedy School and had come to India. Uh, so we both found ourselves as newbies in this vast bureaucracy, working with uh, this very dynamic uh, but powerful set of uh, economists. Um, and that combination, I think, being able, having the, the good for fortune of wonderful mentors who were keen to allow you the space to learn and, and learn, be, and were very generous with their time and their willingness to work and author with you. And uh, a friend uh, who was as uh, you know, somebody who one got along very well with and was uh, learning and uh, along the same path as you. So we came together and did a lot of fun things uh, in, in our time at the World Bank. Uh, but working there, uh, you know, I, I, when I walked in, really thought that this is where I was going to make my career um, and that the trajectory up would be from Delhi to Washington and I would be one of many bureaucrats. Uh, something about that experience uh, did two things for me. One, it made me realize that uh, I'm not a good bureaucrat and maybe it was because I worked on a team of mavericks within the bank, all of whom were fighting the bureaucracy of the bank as they were trying to push the bank to think differently about accountability, governance, health, education. Um, but also that this, the incentive structure within the bank is Washington word and my incentive structure to be in this space was very India specific. Uh, and it did strike me that you know those two worlds uh, in a you know may never work, um, and uh, that I also you know maybe also the influence of the Ford Foundation that having had a combination of grassroots experience, the opportunity at the bank to really build on. Uh, uh, build one's analytical frameworks that I wanted to go back to the grassroots a little bit more. This is also when the right to information, the national employment guarantee, all of this was happening. So there was a lot of, there's a very exciting and bubbling moment. There's a lot of enthusiasm uh, in social policy in India. We were entering a new phase, civil society organizations now part of the landscape of policy making. Um, so I went back to uh, social movements, spent a lot of time studying the social audits uh, particularly, but did so from a very clearly, it was always clear in my mind that having had the, the experiences with NGOs that I, I always wanted to be involved, but from a researcher's perspective. I, and I think this was where the bank experience began to shape my interest in research, that that sort of allows one to analytically look at questions, build a certain objectivity into how one views the world and engages with it uh, without falling into the trap of not necessarily ideologies as much as the trap of black and white. I was too curious about change to believe that there's only one path to change. Um, and that, and you know, that was strange to me because of course I did along the way grapple with the question of doing a PhD or not and chose not to do one because I didn't want to be an academic. Uh, but academic tools allowed me a lot of flexibility and freedom. Uh, and having done that for a few years, uh, CPR2 uh, coincidentally at the time was going through its own transitions. Uh, and I had, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, spent some time talking to Pratap who basically said, 
you know, we are building up CPR, come here, do your thing, no one will stop you, do this the way you want to do it. Um, and, you know, we'll help you along the way if you think our help will be helpful, but we're not going to box you in into becoming an academic or publishing in a certain way or doing certain kinds of policy engagements. Um, and I thought that would be, you know, that, that I, and I also uh, found that CPR was beginning to attract some really interesting uh, call, uh, people um, and that after after having left the uh, the hallowed portals of the World Bank and having had the experience of working with pe pe minds like Lance and Jeffs and others, um, you know, I was missing that kind of intellectual rigor. So CPR seemed to be an obvious place and everything that Pratap said to me at the time about what CPR could offer turned out to be true. I was only going in for two years um, and I've been there now for 11. <laughs> so, so that's how I entered the world of policy research, which was never quite where I thought I would be. Uh, but I've been very lucky along the way, uh, having uh, both uh, met colleagues who became friends and partners in crime in a lot of the research agendas that I laid out. And in having been met entered. Um, as soon as I came to CPR, I uh, spent some time with Pratham and with Rukmini uh, doing some doing a small study for them uh, on the Asar survey. And uh, somewhere along the way, uh, everything I learned from that process uh, and uh, the mentorship I received from Rukmini played a very, very significant role in shaping how we build accountability initiatives. Uh, of course, colleagues at CPR, uh, Pratap himself and others have all been, uh, you know, when you're in a place where uh, everybody else is excelling, it just automatically propels you in the direction of feeling like I better live up to the expectations of my colleagues. So, so I think I, the things that have really shaped my career have been sheer luck uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, that, that has allowed me to find colleagues and partners in crime along the way that have, uh, with whom I've learned and worked so closely and having really amazing mentors who have supported me, propelled me, encouraged me and allowed me to take risks everywhere, uh, every, uh, every step of the way. Hey, thank you so much for that uh, fascinating journey. And I think somewhere for many of us quite familiar too, especially in the early days where you have this uh, influences growing up, but you also um, are, you know, feel this inexplicable pull towards different opportunities than the ones your parents' generation had. So I think um, that was a fascinating journey. Thank you so much for sharing. And, um, you know, you spoke about accountability initiative. And for many of us in the social policy space, that is like a, you know, knowledge base that we go to when we want to find out, uh, you know, what is what is really happening with this gigantic state. So um, I was, we were just wondering, like, what is what was that process? Uh, what was that process like of setting up, and where did this idea come from, and how did you go about practically doing it, like pitching the idea and securing the funding to set it up? And if you could speak to some challenges along the way that you faced uh, in setting this up, we'd be happy to know that. Thank you. Thanks. It's it's always uh, I, I always think of accountability initiative as my first first baby that is now maturing and uh, going in different directions. So it's always really heartening to hear that that little experiment has has taken a life of its own. Um, you know, uh, actually, the I. Uh, uh, it, so when I finished my stint at the bank, um, it was a slightly funny phase because, uh, uh, you know, you all, I'm sure all of you have had similar experiences that in, in, in what I felt often in one's career trajectory. Uh, the early days are very easy in the sense that everyone is, you're, you know, whether it's in your workplace or with, your, with mentors, bosses, uh, the ecosystem, you know, everybody gives you a free pass to begin with. There's a lot of uh, space to to say, especially in the early days, there's space to say, here's an interesting person, we brought in a high quality person, let's let them prove themselves. And uh, if we are lucky, which is not always the case, and I certainly feel I have been remarkably lucky with the kinds of 
open work uh, spaces I've I have been in um, that uh, I, I've been in teams that have been very very encouraging of giving one space to do so. But as one, you know, so, so once you cross that first hurdle of doing something, you know, it might be nothing. Just you know, uh, giving a uh, making sure that you lived up to the deadline your boss gave you and proofread what you sent them. That you know tweaks their interest in saying okay. And let me work more closely, support this person a little bit more. Um, and then you sort of get to the next stage where you get the opportunity to actually take some of your ideas, do something more. Uh, but at some point that plateaus. Uh, and I think that's kind of what was happening with me uh, at the World Bank as well, in the sense that to begin with, uh, I was on a learning curve and it was a fast I mean, I remember my first conversation with Lant, we were in some, uh, I think we were traveling in Calcutta or somewhere it was some long field trip so he was uh, asking you know he, he was sort of doing a q a with me and, and 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 asking deep questions and at one point he was like so why didn't you do the mpid degree and i had to you know and you know here was this famous economist that we'd all heard about and read about and he's asking me why i didn't go to his school to do his degree and the honest truth was i kind of really wanted to get out of delhi and go back to studying and i i was missing coffee and i was was missing the pubs and I couldn't quite say that to him. So I had to come up with some convoluted excuse. Uh, but I did always feel that uh, the one thing that was missing in my very complicated sort of opportunistic education trajectory was this was an instant was a disciplinary anchor. And in working with the with with these uh, with this team, I really got that, and I think that that I, I was just I was sure luck it could have gone any other way, um, and and so 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 there was a high in those early years, and then we were able to Salima and I together experimented a lot, and you know try started these new studies on social audits, uh, and and sort of try to do things differently, um, but the high of that was beginning to wane, and on my mind was the next big question, and the next question was self evident. Do you want to now entrench yourself in the World Bank bureaucracy or do you want to do something different? And all of these, this whole team that I was working with was also going off. They were, you know, everybody was going back to, uh, to, to their older lives. Some were going back to the bank, other land was going back to the Kennedy School, Salima was going to Google, had set up a foundation. So she was going off to the States there. And so I was feeling a little bit at sea about uh, what, what I would do next. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was in that phase that uh, I transitioned into, and then various sort of bureaucratic issues showed up at the bank, and eventually I left and and spent and and went off. And I felt that instead of going after this after the bank, instead of jumping straight into another institution, um, I, it would be better for me. Since my instinct was saying none of these are working for you, you'll have to chart your own course. Let me just spend some time charting my own course. And so that's why I, I, I spent a lot of time. I'm working with the you know on the social audits which were really at the, in this is 2007 narega had just been implemented mass social audits were being done all across the country i had started doing a lot of research on it so i thought this was a natural next step and i uh, and um and began engaging more deeply with what does it actually mean to build these cutting edge accountability systems at the grassroots. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, it was about then uh, that this, this opportunity for to, 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 to make my way into CPR came about. It came about in two ways. One, CPR was looking for random interesting people and I was lucky enough uh, uh, to, to be, uh, to have the opportunity to meet Pratap and 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 talk to him, um, and also you know in in uh, when when Pratap joined the World Bank uh, joined CPR the World Bank was doing a series of lectures at CPR. Um, Land Jeff Junaid had all given lectures. Uh, Salima and I presented on a Narega coincidentally on the day that it was passed in Parliament. Uh, so uh, you know so so he was familiar with some of our work. Um, and uh, Salima and Land were working. Uh, Land was at the Kennedy School, but he was affiliated with the foundation that Google had set up. And Google was particularly interested in this question of 
uh, citizen-led accountability. You know, this was also in the days before algorithms became part of our vocabulary and everyone genuinely thought that companies like Google and Facebook were spaces of innovation and forces for good. So they had committed some 1% of their funding. And um, so those guys, so both, so, so, so quite a lot of interesting grants were given to civil society organizations that were experimenting with social accountability is the phrase that was being, was popularized at that time. Um, and I was in regular touch with them talking about what I was learning in the field. And since there was so much, uh, uh, you know, intersection between what I was doing and what their interests were. And, they, and through those conversations, we began talking about the need for a network. Uh, they've, uh, you know, we've collectively felt that there was a lot of sort of different uh, kinds of experiments that were taking place across the country, some of which were networked in through social movements, but they weren't always speaking to each other. So they were keen to, uh, you know, and, and for, 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 for the Google Foundation, this was particularly important because they, you know, they, they were funding citizen report cards somewhere, they were funding social accountability stuff, uh, research somewhere else, they were funding um, social audits, right to information studies. So, you know, that's how I, so when the conversation with Pratap and them coincided, uh, miraculously, Google was available to give us some seed funding. Uh, and the idea really was to set up this network. Uh, but uh, so, so I came into CPR uh, and uh, CPR also at that time was housing the PRS Legislative Research Services, which, uh, you know, the, parlia the, the, uh, uh, the parliamentary research services, which gives those legislative, which was at the time only doing the legislative brief for parliament. So there was a very interesting model in CPR of a interesting idea that was being incubated with the objective of building an institution out of it for the long term. Uh, so that seemed to me to be a good model because I didn't want to be locked into an academic kind of career trajectory or, an academic, or any expectation that I would you know, be an academic in the long term. So, it, so th that was the context in which I came to CPR with the idea of setting up in this accountability initiative to begin with as a network, but in the long term as a national institution that would study, engage with questions of citizen-led accountability. Um, as luck would have it, almost as soon as I uh, the grant came through and I, uh, I made my way into CPR, uh, Google Google.org decided that, oh, sorry, Google.com decided that it no longer wanted to do this kind of philanthropy. Um, and that instead it wanted to do philanthropy that would use Google tools to promote development in the whole world. Um, and so both Salima and Lance sort of left, uh, but the grant had already come. I was very neatly ensconced in my room at, uh, at CPR. Um, and that was actually the first big challenge because I suddenly found that here I was with a ton of, with, a, with what at the time seemed to be a ton of money and what was clearly an opportunity, but everything that we had planned to do is no longer viable or possible. And uh, the assumption I had always made was that, you know, there would be this group of us that would work collectively to build this idea. Uh, but that group had now dispersed and moved on. Uh, and suddenly it was just me. Uh, and I looked back to CPR to see what kind of, you know, in, uh, engagement I could get uh, or mentorship I, guidance I could get rather. And I found that, you know, in many ways, the academic side of CPR was dominant. Uh, and I was clear that's not what I want to do. So I, you know, suddenly I was, you know, it was a frustrating and scary moment because I never thought I had any enterprise in me. Uh, but here I was and there was nobody to tell me what I needed to do. Um, and, you know, that again, just uh, uh, it converted into a moment. I'd already begun all these conversations with Pratham and spent a lot of time learning from them. Um, instinctively, I've always felt that a lot of what I was learning about the cutting edge of accountability at the grassroots uh, was confronting the big black box of the state. It wasn't quite uh, interacting with, with, with the state in a way that was making the state look different. Uh, you know, so uh, social uh, audits in Andhra Pradesh were repeatedly highlighting different kinds of issues with implementation but the architecture of the Mandal office at the time is what it was, uh, was not changing in response. So it seemed to me that there was something missing here that I wanted to understand better. And uh, Pratham had just set up the Asar Center. They were very encouraging and enthusiastic about the idea of partnering with us. 
Um, and so we, we, we came together uh, to say, okay, let's just experiment with what, it, in fact, the JPAL, the first big JPAL study that I became familiar with in, uh, in the sort of Pratham JPAL partnership uh, had just been completed, the UP study on uh, the, you know, what uh, uh, citizen eng parent engagement in schools, what are ways in which that could be encouraged. And so Rukmini and I were talking and Rukmini said, you know, the, pro the thing with a, with, a, with, a, with a RCT is you have a set of experiments. You can't play around with those experiments as you learn because it takes away from what the RCT is uh, trying to do. So how about we take some of those learnings and experiment uh, to see are there different ways in which one can engage these parent teacher associations to work with bureaucracies, uh, uh, to work with the schools to, to demand and place accountability claims, which sounded like a very wise and sensible way forward for us. I had resources uh, and uh, um, uh, nothing, uh, nothing on my plate. And this was exactly a law. And, you know, I, I was incentivized by the idea that we could come up with a nice little peer reviewed report, uh, journal article that would, you know, satisfy, tick a lot of boxes and life will be good. So that's how the first partnership began for accountability initiative. Uh, we hired a couple of colleagues. Uh, Avni joined uh, very much in the early stages. Uh, and she too took a risk that, uh, uh, you know, I, I have to really credit her for because there was nothing. CPR was still known as CPR amongst in the Delhi circles, a place that was beginning to change, but bohat time lagega. why would you want to go there right at the beginning? Accountability initiative didn't even exist. Uh, you know, I was just an upstart. Yet she was willing to come and join our team. And it made all the difference because finally now I had a partner in crime all over again, which always emboldens me and helps. And with, uh, with Pratham, we went off to, a couple, uh, to, to, um, to Madhya Pradesh. Uh, and as, almost as soon as we began, we realized that the challenge with these planning, but with, these, with this participation story is that you need something. What is it that groups, what is it that parent teacher associations can do when they come together? So there all my academic work and everything I had learned from the World Bank came in handy because I knew about these plans that are supposed to be made. So I said, how about we do participatory planning exercises? And the NGO sector was full of all of that in the days that I was working with the SAG. So we had learned all those PRA tools and so on and so forth. So feeling very proud of myself, we started doing these planning for the uh, for the schools, but uh, obviously the first question when you make a plan is the budget kya hai, uh, and that's what led us into this big bad world of the budgets. I knew a lot about budget analysis because in my days of uh, at the Ford Foundation, mm -hmm. a lot of these civil society organizations had begun mushrooming, and Ford played a big role in supporting and funding them that were beginning to do budget transparency and budget accountability analysis, which was basically looking at budgets from the point of view of how much resources are being allocated to social sectors. The conversation was always about resource allocation. It never really went beyond that to the question of re expenditures themselves. Uh, so when we were confronted with this question, we went to NIPFP uh, and found another partner in crime, Anit Mukherjee, who willingly joined us to try and answer what was actually a very fundamental but easy, I thought, budget question. Out of your 10,000 crores or 12,000 crores, whatever the number was of Sarva Shiksha Abhyan budget that was given by Government of India, what percentage reaches schools in a manner that the Parent Teacher Association can make a plan for expenditure? And Anit, when we first asked him this question, laughed his head off and said, yeah, there's no way in hell you can answer this. Uh, to, uh, to, and to us, uh, that just seemed an absurd thing. So, uh, so, so we then began to try and experiment with seeing how can we actually answer this question? Where is guest, guest estimates were made and Avni's diligence and hard work paid fruit because she went into those complicated MIS systems in ways that I would never have had the patience for. To be this onion and discover that there's only some 15,000 rupees that reaches the school bank account in a way that the parent teacher association can actually spend it. So that was a very important learning number one. We talk about participation and accountability at the grassroots, but for the state to be responsive to demands coming from people, it also needs to have power in a way that it can actually, if it wants to, be responsive. And one of the fascinating things about the social audit that I studied in Andhra Pradesh was here was a government that basically said, come and become me. 
you know, I'm going to open myself up and let people through some organized structure come and audit my processes. So governments can open up if you price them open in certain ways, but can they be responsive? And as we, you know, that's sort of a long story there, but as we did this, we went deeper into these, uh, working with these parentage associations in these eight villages, we discovered that it's not just that we don't have a budget, but also that nobody knows when the money will actually reach. That was the genesis of PESA. So, where, so you know, we realized that if you just narrow down on the budget as an instrument, it tells you a lot about the functioning of the, of the state that everybody yearns for, and also gives some hints into the missing link of accountability at the grassroots. It tells you that, uh, you know, um, where power is located in the state, how decisions get taken, what kind of authority do local governments and local uh, expenditure entities actually have, and what accountability and governance actually means for the state. Um, so uh, having been influenced by Asar, we thought, is there a way to Asarify this? And Asar very graciously uh, allowed us to put some questions into their school observation tool in 2010 or nine, uh, one of those years. And so there we had it without too much effort. We had the first national expenditure tracking survey on education. Um, along the way, two other influences. Uh, one, I was watching PRS evolve a lot and realized that one of the big things when you're trying to plant, uh, when you're trying to anchor an idea is that you have to be able to productize things. And PRS's legislative briefs were a really cool product. Um, and so we, so, I, so we felt that, you know, since it took us the better part of eight months with NIPFP to figure out what the education budget for India is, presumably this is a problem not just for education, but for lots of other schemes. And so we thought we have to do this anyway for us to better understand this question. Why not productize it? That was the genesis of the budget briefs uh, that then allowed us a very wide floor. It gave us the opportunity to look at different schemes. It gave us the opportunity to learn a lot more about different sectors while we were honing our understanding in education. Of course, we had to convince people. I remember even Pratap was not convinced when I told him we wanted to do expenditure tracking in education for accountability initiative. Because he was like, but all of education money goes to teachers' wages. What are you going to learn here? Um, but, you know, in his true style, he was like, I'm going to ask you questions, but if you think this makes sense, you would know best, go for it. Uh, and so we did uh, and proved uh, to folks that actually there's a lot to learn even when 80% of, of, of budgets are tied to, uh, tied to salaries. Um, and so, uh, and, and then we were supported by funders that gave us a lot of core funding, which helped to, to really experiment and innovate. And that's how accountability was created and sustained. Great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think it was really fascinating to know how this um, resource has been developed over, uh, over many years. Um, so I think taking a little bit of a big picture view, um, there was a question uh, which we'd collected beforehand on, uh, you know, how all of India's institutions and the policies that uh, are formulated have a caste problem. So uh, there are very few organizations which have Dalit leaders at the forefront. Um, so how do we make sure that the country's most marginalized voices gain a seat at the table where decisions are being made? Um, and if you could personalize that a little bit and talk about how uh, either in the individual capacity or at CPR, um, what has been done to sort of amplify these voices. And I think uh, accountability initiative is one of those rare examples where there is a direct connect to the people um, and, you know, you're giving them a voice. Um, so, yeah, I would love to know about that. So, you know, this is a very important question uh, and one to which I have very bad answers. Uh, we grapple with this institutionally at CPR as well. Uh, if you look at our representation, we, we, we're we relatively good on gender, but frankly, we are not uh, very representative across uh, communities. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the policy answer to this has been firmly in the direction of affirmative action. Um, and institutionally, uh, uh, so, so, you know, intellectually, that makes absolute sense. Institutionally, if I were to just put on a very narrow hat of my institution, it poses very critical questions. One, in the, the minute you create a set of quote, uh, a set of 
policy quotas and uh, thing um, and and directions the ability of the state to intervene and interfere uh, gets enhanced and exaggerated and the one thing that we know about indian institutions especially public institutions in india is that the state has a way of converting everything into rules in ways that stymie flexibility innovation and capacity and it reduces institutional choices to check boxes which are deeply problematic for this long term sustainability of the institution but even more importantly for the long term goal of making institutions more representative because institutions also begin to dig their heels in we really struggled with this um and uh, uh it, it and i think in india you know one can't take the institutional question out of the political moment as well which then makes it a lot harder uh harder to uh the other uh way in which uh, one can think about greater representation is how does one ensure that representation uh comes in the issues that one works on and in the intellectual agendas that one sets and most importantly in challenging those in in intellectual agendas and to me i think we've had a degree more of success as an institution in that sphere in that we have actively said we want to work on questions that are difficult often not mainstream policy questions but questions on rights whether it is land whether it is public services uh, uh and and so on and when you enter questions of public services uh and, and and policy from the perspective of rights and justice it automatically pushes you to start asking questions about what this what does this mean for the most marginalized and then you have to ask about authenticity of claims and authentic authenticity of voices that one as as policy actors we present and i think that pushes us to be a, a lot more deliberative and a lot more open to bringing newer and different voices into our uh, into our sphere one of the cautions there is that i think what we tend to do and as as a woman i find this happens to me a lot too so i can and i'm a very privileged woman so i can imagine what it's like uh, in other contexts is that you you try to box people in so as a woman i want to hear your voice as a woman's voice i don't necessarily want to hear your voice as a core intellectual contribution so when you are bringing in uh, uh you know uh, the uh, I, I mean, you know, as in, I'm going to be really candid over here. But as institutions, when you start thinking, "Oh God, I have to meet these," uh, th there are five quotas I have to meet. Which is the Dalit voice I can bring in? That's exactly the wrong thing to do. But we find ourselves being boxed into that. And worse, when we do it from an intellectual point of view, we say, "I want the Dalit voice to tell me about the Dalit experience to authenticate me," and that I think creates a power dynamic and a power asymmetry that is deeply problematic. So I think the way out. of this conundrum and it's a very serious conundrum is to in as institutions and as researchers to be very conscious and aware and reflective about this we were having a discussion the other day on politics uh, um uh, we have a team at cpr that works on uh, the changing dynamics of indian politics and we had a uh, we, we had a webinar on uh, you know contemporary political thought in india and and our moderator asked one of our muslim panelists a question about the muslim voice and he immediately he said just because this is my name doesn't mean that you should be asking me this question i'm going to separate out my answers i will answer this question but i want to separate it out from these two perspectives and i think that reminded me again that we have to be very reflective very conscious very self critical uh, but at the same time very consciously open to bringing in voices and bringing in um uh, 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 people from diverse experiences we've just had this conversation internally also as we were streamlining some of our recruitment and hiring processes and one of my colleagues called me and said look you know everything you're doing makes absolute sense when you think of cpr as a high quality internationally reputed institution but don't you think we risk now only taking in people with uh, degrees from universities abroad if you make it so tight i hadn't even thought about that 
only thing I was thinking about was I want to make sure that I get the best talent globally. Uh, and so I tightened a, a lot of things and put my point structure in a way. Um, and he said, we are a policy research institution based in India. Sometimes the academically best may not necessarily be able to give you the most important voice that you need to hear. How do we break this? So I think, uh, you know, um, in CPR, we have not succeeded at all, but we've consciously tried to be a little more reflective and reflexive in our engagement on this question. There is no perfect answer. Um, and while I agree with the importance of, of sort of reservation policies and their relevance for institutions, I've also seen their limitations. Um, and, and I think that what we certainly can do with last names like Ayer is to be conscious of our privilege and at least ensure that we present in a voice as policy researchers that has integrity and that has authenticity to the extent that is possible. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. And, and it's a very complex issue. Uh, so thank you for unpacking that so well. It's, it's a lot of questions about identities and whose voice matters actually comes into the picture here. So um, uh, thank you for that answer. And uh, I think we're almost uh, out of time. So maybe if people can stick around for 10 more minutes, um, and then we can um, hear a little bit more uh, from Yamini. And um, uh, so I think what the people here would like to really hear from you is, um, you know, what are some of the policy questions that um, sort of excite you uh, in, in the current context in India? And what are some things that concern you? And as young, uh, you know, economists and public policy graduates and professionals, what do you hope that the next generation um, sort of picks up as important issues and starts working on. So, um, so look, I mean, of course, I'm uh, the, the most passionate about this question of citizen state engagement, uh, uh, most crucially. Uh, but, but from that starting point, uh, I have looked at uh, um, the Indian policy, the Indian policy landscape, uh, and it has raised some very important questions that concern me a lot today. Uh, the one big question is about public institutions, and CPR is. Uh, part of the public institution ecosystem to a small degree. So lived experience perhaps has made me even more uh, conscious of this. Um, I, but, you know, the question of what does it take to genuinely build a robust uh, uh, public institutions that uh, perform their core function, uh, regardless of the political influences within which they rest, because institutions, politics, and society are, are, are intertwined, is something that um, I think we need to think about a lot harder in India and engage with very, very deeply. And it pushes you back to the core constitutional questions of how these institutional dynamics were framed and forged in the first place. Um, and it also brings you to present day concerns of state capacity in a very, very big way as well. Uh, so that uh, is, is, I think, to me, a very, very important question. And Institutions are of different levels. I mean, so when talking about everything from the Gram Panchayat to the block office to, uh, you know, the courts and the RBI, um, one can pick up on each of these in different ways. But I think the fundamental question of uh, institutional to create of create what does it take to create an institutional ecosystem that has integrity, that responds to its ecosystem, that is accountable and in, and whose organizational purpose is linked to the core purpose of the institution is something that um, I'm very keen to understand better. It integrates into uh, another set of concerns that I've been uh, engaging with a lot uh, in this last year, particularly the question of federalism uh, and center state relations, uh, which uh, I think are at a very, very crucial cusp of transformation, both in our the nature of our politics, but also in the nature of our economy. The GST is a good example of uh, an economy that is moving in a more integrated fashion towards creating national markets uh, um, uh, at one level, uh, but also bringing in new kinds of institutional requirements for center state dynamics to be reshaped and rechanged. How do we actually negotiate those is crucial in the context of a single party political majority that also has a politically centralizing tendency. Uh, the, uh, the, 
and these all coalesce into, I think, a larger question that uh, as a policy institution, we need to grapple with a lot more. And as policy researchers, we, I think, need to be more conscious of, uh, which I think is that you know, there are a lot of well accepted uh, pathways for economic progress. And I think India is now nicely upending all of that. Uh, the 1991 moment told us that there are certain ways in which the economy needs to go, and those ways will lead us to uh, greater growth and progress. I think we are seeing, regardless of how much of that project is still unfulfilled, but we are seeing that those relationships are not automatic and that the challenges of persistent inequality and persistent uh, informality uh, are significant ones. Um, and we need to think about how to create new frameworks for growth paths. Of course, factor market reforms are crucial, but uh, you know, all of this is taking place at a time where uh, both um, globalization is looking very different today. I won't go so far as to say there's deglobalization, but it's certainly looking different today than it was in the 1990s. We know of the limits of uh, a certain kind of um, a growth path uh, in democratic context, so by which I mean the limits of radical factor market reforms in democratic context, where issues of social justice and rights do come into play in our politics, even though economists get tired with that. But I think those make for more troubling, but longer term, more sustainable, better communities, better societies. So that integration between economics and so society is crucial. And we're also doing it at a time when uh, we're also having to confront the realities of technology, the realities of urbanization, the realities of climate change, which make the pathways of growth need to look different. So I think there's a very big a uh, harder question to ask, left, right, center, none of it matters anymore. Uh, I think we have to chart new courses. And that means that we have to go back to how academia is organized, how policy research is organized, how policy is made in all of its silos uh, to fundamentally try and rewrite that book. It's an exciting thing because, because the book is empty, uh, the pages are blank, uh, but uh, do we have the tools to be able to rethink is a question mark uh, that needs to be uh, understood and engaged with a little bit more. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think the next generation of um, researchers and policy researchers are going to have quite a big task on their hands and, uh, you know, almost grappling with these really big existential questions um, to, some, to some extent. Um, so as, as a, I think a final question, um, since we are all uh, sort of young uh, professionals or recent college graduates, uh, what would your advice be uh, to people like that, uh, you know, who are looking to work in the development and social policy space? Um, and especially now, I think because of COVID, do you think there will be any impact on these sectors in, you know, since many industries have been touched by COVID. So do you think there will be any changes in the sort of uh, hiring or, um, you know, uh, job market in this space and what advice would you have to uh, young people out there? So I think um, the one thing that I, uh, my own professional trajectories uh, uh, sort of uh, suggest, I don't think that there is any one path in this sector. Uh, I think that, uh, I, and very often, uh, you know, uh, young graduates come uh, to, to talk about policy advice, about pro uh, career advice. Um, and and, I, and I, I, I do think that one needs to, that, that you know, people are looking for, here's the one place that I can start and it'll take me tuck, 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 tuck to the next five levels and along the way I'll do some experimentation. But I don't think that this sector is like that. It's a very, it's a, very, it's a sector with with great variation in the kinds of ways in which one can engage with these transitions and processes of social change. And really you have to find what suits you, your personality, your lifestyle and your life choices best. And be very open since this is a conversation with young women. Uh, I must say that it's very important for you to remember two things. One, no decision that you take today is mm -hmm. going to shape your future in a way that will prevent you from doing things going forward. There is no such thing as a neatly defined career ladder you can step off you can step back on you can race right up and you can race sideways you can go in circles uh, and be very open to the fact that uh, sometimes life will take over and sometimes careers will take over and lives are long and careers are 
wrong and one has to find that happy balance between those two. There is no such thing also, I must say, as a happy balance between those two. There'll always be tensions. Uh, but you'll have to find ways of navigating those tensions in ways that suit you as a person more. So don't ever get angsty if you feel like, I want to step off the career ladder and spend two years with my children uh, and then feel like, oh my God, what is that going to do to my next, to my next big professional move? Believe me, you'll find a way back and you'll find a way back that works well for you. And for those uh, like me who are, uh, re who refuse for some reason to step off the career ladder, even when you have children, uh, you will have to readjust ways in which you work and that too will find its way. It'll come, but it will only come when you're open-minded about it and you're able to recognize that there's no one path. You'll have to find a path that suits you, suits the person you are, suits the context in which you're working. Um, and to be able to be that person when you start, you must get lost in the weeds and find your way. Uh, now with technology and phones and everything, field work doesn't feel as daunting. I, I really resisted this idea of being out in the boondogs when I first started working. This was before mobile phones and, 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 and emailing. We still had to go to STD booths to call our friends and, and feel a sense of attachment with the, with the world that one knew. But all that has changed and mobility is so much more. So you can live in a city and go to the field and you can do it through research you can do it through social movements or you can do it through, through NGOs or you can do it even now through these government fellowships. Do that. I really feel that don't think that writing an op-ed and writing a research paper is the path to careers. Really working with the people about whose lives you want to engage with, whether in an air-conditioned room in Delhi or whether in the field in in, in Punya, uh, in, the, in your future life, dealing with those people so that you can close your eyes and actually imagine what a self-help group meeting looks like, what a broken down school looks like, what a watershed site looks like, what a Narega work site looks like. The voices of that you hear in your early careers will shape how you understand that. And then meander through and find different ways uh, and you will find them. But as many of you who are academics, the one thing I miss a lot uh, uh, is that academic uh, core academic discipline. I feel great freedom that I'm not an economist, not a political scientist and not a sociologist and not an anthropologist. So I can do ethnographies and I can work with quantitative data sets. Uh, and that frees me up in many ways. But I also often wish I was one of those so I could train my mind to be focused on one way of looking at the world while I bring in all these different things. Uh, so so I, I think that's something I miss a lot. And I think that uh, it's as you think about your PhDs or next uh, career moves, that, that disciplinary anchor is important. Um, and, uh, you know, what COVID will do is it'll, it's not just COVID, it's also the regulatory environment. I think it's closing off spaces uh, and it's making the high, the job market quite tight. But also remember, uh, this is a job market where talent is scarce uh, relative to many others and uh, where competition is significant uh, because we've also in the last five, six years seen this proliferation of policy think tanks, of research institutions, of private universities and so on. Um, and so for a group of talented young women like yourselves, that's never going to be a problem. You will have the world coming to you, knocking on your door, asking for you to come in. Make careful, judicious choices that allow you to experiment and to be free. And often the one thing uh, I feel matters the most is being able to find yourselves in an institutional environment where you have colleagues that are uh, that push you, uh, that whom you can work with, write with, but keep making you think harder and, are, and critique you. And you find mentors that can work with you and support you, uh, for whom hierarchy is in the beginning and end of all, but encouraging young minds is the beginning and end of all. Those are not easy to find. But you know, even if it's on a topic you have no interest in, if you find these two things, I'd say just go for it. It'll take you in directions that you never imagined. Thank you so much for that uh, candid and hopeful answer. And uh, just as a wrap up, this is a question we ask to all our uh, speakers. Uh, what are you reading right now? And uh, can you give us some interesting book recommendations now that we all have so much time on our hands? 
<laughs> what am I reading right now? Well, I'm actually reading two different books simultaneously. <laughs> I'm reading, I'm reading a, 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 a something called Normal People that by Sally Rudy that apparently has a next Netflix video uh, as well. And the only reason I'm reading it is because it was lying on my bedside. My husband was reading it and said, this is full of really cool. Uh, th th this is a quirky book. So I picked it up and I started reading it. It, it is quite quirky and, and fun. So I, so, so that's, uh, that's what I'm reading in my fiction. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, tonight I won't fall asleep on my book and actually finish it. I'm halfway through and really enjoying it. Um, and I am also reading, so we, we did a book launch recently for him, so it's on my desk. Uh, Yogendra Yadav has a new book called Making Sense of uh, Indian Democracy, uh, which is a, 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 a coming together of a lot of his old essays uh, and then some, some reflections on where India is going today, which I think is a really interesting study on the dynamics, the shifting dynamics of uh, India's democracy. Um, and then I also went back, so my kids are eight and five, and on uh, the 2nd of October, uh, I decided that this is my time to educate them about the India that I believe in, which I firmly believe is going through transitions, and they will be living in a very different India. So I forced them to sit and watch the, at least they sat through half of it, the Gandhi, uh, uh, the, uh, the film on Gandhi that we all used to, Doordarshan used to show it, at least when I was growing up, every 2nd October and diligently the whole household would watch it. So these two kids, of course, have no interest, but anything that involves a screen and YouTube makes them stare blindly. So they, we watched half of it. But while I was watching it, it just sort of, uh, there were these, it, there's this reminder actually that so much of our movement for independence was not about elite imaginations of Western liberalism and a, a, a view of the world, but actually a genuine movement of people with lots of disagreements, lots of debate, lots of dissent, uh, and lots of critique about what the idea of India actually was. Uh, and it moved me uh, in, in many ways. Uh, so I picked up uh, Ram Guha's Making of the Mahatma and started reading. I just randomly picked it up in, uh, three days ago and was looking at uh, some of his arguments between with Ambedkar, in fact, on the question of, um, uh, of which went into the Pune Act on the question of reservations and elections for. So, uh, so you know, uh, that also is a, so clearly a lot of those, those fundamental questions are back in play in how all of us are also looking at our lives. So um, that's another one that I'm reading right now too. So I, I'm, I'm I, like I said, my mind needs to be trained to focus just on one thing. It does too many things at the same time. So there's all these three different things happening together in a little khichdi. That's lovely. Uh, thank you so much, Yamini, for spending your <coughs> Saturday morning with us. Uh, and over to Prashanta for the closing. Thank you so much. I think Niharika uh, has, has thanked uh, Yamini, but thank you for the honest conversation and for sharing your journey with us. I think a lot of uh, the participants will find your journey very inspiring and I think we can also relate to the, to the stories that you've shared. And uh, thank you, Niharika, for moderating and uh, for being such an excellent moderator and guiding the conversation so well. And thank you to our participants for joining on a Saturday morning. Um, and we have more sessions coming up, so stay tuned to our website and follow us on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute privilege to be here and look forward to engaging with all of you in the future. Thank you. Bye. Bye.